Wall Street Unplugged looks beyond the regular headlines heard on mainstream financial media to bring you unscripted interviews and breaking commentary direct from Wall Street right to you on Main Street. How's going out there? It's July 17th. I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, why break down the headlines and tell you what's really moving these markets. So, if you're in Vegas right now at Freedom Fest, you're waiting for me to present at the conference, you probably just realized something, that I'm actually not at the conference. So my apologies, I was really looking forward to Freedom Fest, scheduled to speak several times, bull bear debates and everything, great speech prepared, also had lots of meetings set up, but I had to cancel last minute. And I always share everything with you guys. So, yeah, my father-in-law is pretty sick, and they found a tumor in his lungs. He's a smoker. Uh, he had to get it removed. We were pretty sure it was going to be cancerous. Uh, you know, he lives in New York. He's also 75 years old. And, you know, so the surgery was risky by itself, but just to get a biopsy didn't make sense since that's like an operation in itself. So they just went in there, removed the whole thing. And this happened just a couple of days ago. So it was successfully removed. And they did confirm it is cancerous and it's a bad form of cancer. Uh, that's all we know right now. And yeah, they're running more tests and they're going to give them the final diagnosis next week and, and we'll see what happens. But, you know, once we found out, which was not too long ago, probably about four or five days ago, uh, you know, I told my wife, listen, just go to New York. Just go. Just go. I'll take care of everything. Just go and don't worry about anything else. Uh, so, you know, I was basically watching the kids the past week, keeping the fort down, doing everything for the business. But, um, you know, I had to cancel late, which I never do. And I'm really big on commitments, but look, you know, as you guys know, you've been listening to me for a long time, you know, family first, that's why we're all doing this. That's why we all invest, you know, to, to hopefully increase generational wealth. And, you know, I'm very big on family as you guys know. So, uh, you know, Mark Skousen, who runs the Freedom Fest, uh, conference and who actually called me personally to invite me. I mean, he understood hundred percent and, uh, I told him I'll definitely make it next year, make it up to him. I did provide a discount for listeners to go to freedom fest and those who took me up on that offer, which, you know, by the way, I don't receive a dime for everybody that comes up in here. I, I try to offer really good things. I mean, sometimes we do affiliate deals depending on this, but you know, with this, uh, yeah, I didn't receive a dime for anything. They did give us a discount, a special discount. But, uh, if you, if, you took me up on that offer. Just reach out to me, frankcurseyresearch.com. I'll take care of you. I could offer you, you know, a six month free subscription to one of my products or whatever, because, uh, yeah, you know, the conference is awesome. It has over 200 speakers. There's so much to do there. And I know some of you went there specifically to listen to my speech and meet me personally. And I really appreciate that. So I'm sorry I missed the conference. The good news is there's 200 speakers there and you're in Las Vegas. <laughs> it could be worse. It could be a lot of other places that are not as fun. But if you went there specifically for me, reach out to me and let me know because, uh, you know, I really had plans to meet some of you. Some of you just say, Frank, where are you going to be? I'd like to grab a beer. And, you know, but again, family first. And this came up really last minute. And, uh, yeah, so so I just want to apologize to you guys. Sorry about missing that conference because I, I love speaking at conferences. I love making those conferences. Uh, I love keeping those commitments. And this is the first time I was speaking at it. So it was really tough, but I really had no choice here. And uh, I know you guys understand. So let's move on here. Favorite time of the year? No, it's not because it's full-time baseball season right now. You guys know how I feel about baseball. But it is earnings season where we've already seen some strong results from banks. And banks always kind of start off the earnings season every single quarter. Strong earnings should come as no surprise, even though interest rates are low, which means their net interest margins are pressured. Usually when interest rates go higher, that, that's good for banks. It's one of the sectors that does well. But throw in all the regulation, and because of the stress tests, right, and this regulation is passed shortly after the credit crisis, banks have to keep more capital on their books today compared to any other time in their history. And they can't lend this money out or be aggressive with it, trading, getting into new markets, because you know everybody believes that's going to be the credit crisis all over again. So they only have two choices of what to do with this money. And those two choices are buying back loads of their stock or increasing their dividend. And the big banks are doing both. So Citigroup, big fan of for a long time in our portfolio, we're up nicely on it, pays a nice dividend. Bought back 10% of its stock over the past year. 10%. That's a huge number, guys. And you look at it, Wells Fargo bought back $20 billion worth of its stock in 2018. Yet Bank of America said just recently they're going to buy back 
another 30 billion under a new buyback program, that's another and another 11% of their shares outstanding. So Citigroup brought back 10%. They're expected to buy back another 10% over the next 18 months or so. JP Morgan said it's going to buy back another 30 billion as well worth of its stock and a new repurchase plan. Looking at all those companies I just mentioned, those big banks, every one of them increased their dividends easily by more than 10% over the past 12 months. Seems like they're increasing their dividend every quarter. Because they have all this money they have nothing to do with. And I have news for you. This trend is not going to change anytime soon. So I was just saying, for at least the past two years, you should own a large cap bank stock in your portfolio. I know a lot of people hate the large cap banks. I don't blame you, and I even hate them at what they did and the risk that they took and got bailed out with taxpayer money and the fact that we didn't even receive any of that money that you made a ton of money on off of our money is pretty crazy. So I get it. You know, they risk your capital, almost bankrupt the world, only to get bailed out. And what? They're even bigger today than they were back then. So if that pisses you off, which it should, you know what? Go vent on social media. Go hold up a sign in front of J.P. Morgan's headquarters saying how much banks suck, whatever you want to do. But if this is about money or making money, go buy a large cap bank. Now, for some reason, when you look at buybacks, this pisses so many people off. I don't get it. You know, guys like Dick Beauvais, you know, he's been probably 10 different companies in nine years, if I had to guess. Pretty good banking analyst. Says that banks buying back so much stock is a horrible thing since banks should not give away capital for stock. Not too sure what else he wants them to do with that money. But there's a lot of analysts out there say, well, if it wasn't for buybacks, not just banks in general, you know, the S&P 500 would be much lower. Earnings would be much lower for so many of these companies. And when I hear that, it's just, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's funny. It, the number one driver of stocks is earnings growth. So by buying back their stock, these companies, they're automatically going to push earnings higher, even in the form of manipulation, legal manipulation. But this is what's driving the bank sector right now. And as an investor, what do you care about? The only thing you should care about is the stock price. You're investing in a stock to make money on it. You want to buy low and sell high. So buying back stock increases earnings at a time where their net interest margins are not really that strong, right? We've seen lower interest rates. Again, I told you earlier, higher interest rates are usually good for banks. If we're raising rates, higher interest rates, they make just have more spread on the interest they charge. It's a lot lower when those interest rates go lower. So this is offsetting that, which is great news. So you have them buying back their stock, which is increasing earnings, right? And then they're raising their dividends, which are all more than 3% on average. I think Citigroup's a little bit lower than that. And JP Morgan is over 3%. Uh, Bank of America is over 3%. It's around 3%, more than 3% around the average. But now by raising your dividend, you're making your stock incredibly appealing for investors who are seeking income, which is basically the entire planet, right? Or trillions of dollars since interest rates are historically low across the world. Everybody's looking for yield. That's why you should have exposure to this sector. Not telling you to be overweight where you have to put all your money in it. No, but you should have some exposure to large banks who are providing growth through buybacks, right? Automatically, earnings growth. And we're not talking about small buybacks here. They're buying back 10, 20% of the shares outstanding. That's the earnings profile. This is why I recommend Citigroup because of this. And now they're seeing business trends pick up, consumer lending increase. They're seeing these trends pick up. Even if they don't, we're safe because they're buying back their stock at all times. Or most of the time, which is providing that floor. When this thing comes down, if, if banks fall 10, 15 percent, how much, you know how much stock these guys are gonna buy if that happens? It's a nice safety net to have. But that's why you need to be, well, have exposure. Again, not be overweight to the sector. Because that growth through buybacks and then income by raising the dividend seems like almost every quarter. And they're, I mean, they're raising it significantly. And they're buying back loads of stock. These trends are not going to stop anytime soon. Now, on deck, we have oil and healthcare companies. What over the next week or so? And these are two of the most depressed sectors, performance wise, year to date. And this week's guest is going to tell you why you should be investing in both at least over the next 12 to 18 months. 
And that guest is Steve Kumar, who's the editor of Vigilante Investor Newsletter. Over 25 years experience analyzing the markets, which includes working at Goldman for a long time, derivatives, and gold proprietary trading, worked at Prudential, where he's a fixed income portfolio manager. So Steve's a good friend, brilliant analyst, and writes one of the few financial newsletters in industry I actually read. I don't mean to put people down in the industry, but whenever I try to read another newsletter, I feel like they're talking about things. 5G is big now. We talk about two and a half, three years ago, so I go to Consumer Electronics Show every year. When I see trends like AI and everything that, that people want to talk about, which are hot right now, it, it's things that I feel like I've been talking about a long time ago. That's the financial newsletter industry. What are you going to do? If you want to talk about the trends when they're at their top and sell them when they're at their top, it's easiest, right? They've got to generate money selling newsletters. So let's talk about the trends that are hot right now. Let's go all in on marijuana. Let's go all in on cryptocurrency right now after the move higher. Yeah, these are things we're talking about for a while. But with Steve, he's always writing about great stuff, new trends. It just has an unconventional approach to looking at things, which always challenges my beliefs. And you know what? I love that as an analyst. You know, for example, last week I had a great interview with Meb Faber. Meb highlighted the need for most investors to get exposure to the international markets. And today, Steve's going to talk about something called the New Strategic Order, which is replacing the New World Order of free trade. New World Order of free trade was around from World War II, 40s, to 2016, when Trump got elected. And when you read what he has to say, it's original stuff. If Steve has a background in history. He's going to show you why you should not be investing abroad. Different from what Meb said, right? Since Europe and China's slow growth problems continue for a very, very long time, regardless of what happens with the trade dispute between the U.S. and China. So he's pro-U.S., says you should keep your money in the U.S., and highlights another country you should be investing in right now, which – is a country maybe the first time I've ever heard anyone say you should be investing in. <laughs> so it's out there. And even better, Steve's going to provide an easy way for you to invest in this idea where any investor with an online brokerage account could get exposure. So to me, this stuff's priceless. You're going to get two different opinions, back-to-back -back podcasts, both with Meb and Steve, and making great points, each of them to support their thesis. You heard from Meb last week. Now let's hear from Steve. This way you can make your own decision on whether it's smart to invest in international markets or not. And let's get to that interview right now. Steve Kumar, thanks so much for joining us again on Wall Street Unplugged. Well, Fra uh, Frank, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Well, I am a big fan of your newsletter, Vigilante Investor, uh, reading the issues and the last few issues I thought were fantastic. So, you know, definitely wanted to have you on to discuss. But before we get to some of those issues, which... Yeah, I'm going to really dig in deep to a, different, a lot of different industries. I, I always like to start out with my guests uh, and talk about the economy, the economic landscape, the markets, where we have, hey, an interest rate cut is widely, widely, widely expected. They don't know if it's going to be 25 basis, 50 basis, most likely 25 basis points. Uh, there are all positives and negatives, but overall, the economy is not, you know, we're used to interest rate cuts when things are really, really bad. And for me, looking at the economic data, I don't see it. I wanted to get your perspective of the economy. What does this mean? Because a lot of people believe we're overvalued. We are in earnings season. But, I mean, I would think, uh, you know, with the Fed not just trying to cut, going to cut interest rates now, but going looks like they're going to adopt that policy over the next couple of years, it's pretty hard to go against that, isn't it? I mean, what are your thoughts on the economy, the markets, and where we're at right now, where we're heading maybe over the next 6, 12 months? Uh, the – at the Fed is doing, I think, exactly what needs to be done to keep the economy moving. Um, we last we talked was uh, in December, I believe, and at that point, I was very concerned that the Fed had raised rates very substantially over the course of you know about a year and a half, and we were at a point where they might be choking off economic growth. And my basic metric was we had uh, private sector debt of about 150 percent of GDP, and if they raised interest rates by two percent. That takes about 3% out of growth. Um, brings you down to kind of a very slow growth territory if that were to happen. But, but uh, they have noticed either uh, by criticism from the president or maybe from their own, uh, their own measurements that the economy is indeed starting to slow down. Um, and they're starting uh, the process of cutting rates. The market thinks they're going to cut rates by about 100 basis points in the next year. And I think 25 basis points 
at the next meeting is an appropriate move, and I think it's an appropriate expectation for the marketplace. And I agree, I think that that continues to fuel uh, economic growth and continues to fuel the market. Um, doesn't mean that it's a straight line higher. A lot of times when there's so much anticipation of, of a interest rate cut as you have right now, it's so into the bond market, it's got to be into the stock market too. So it wouldn't be a surprise if you get an interest rate cut and then you might even get a little bit of a sell-off in the stock market, you know, kind of buy the rumor, sell the news type of event. But over the course of the next year or two, you can look forward to, you know, a very strong economy, helping earnings move higher, helping the economy continue to go 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 higher. And and I and I think that maybe even more important is that where else are you going to put your money if short rates are going down to one and a half percent or somewhere around there? Uh, it kind of leaves the stock market as the only game left in town. And so I think it's just going to, yeah, it seems like maybe it's a little bit high, but I'll bet it gets a lot higher. So, you know, I, I interviewed I someone last week. His name is Meb Faber. Uh, very into you know international markets and diversification. And what you're saying, it's funny because you say this is the only game in town and yeah, whether he's right or wrong, again, I love difference of opinions, but your last issue was really amazing. You're talking about something called the New World Order, right? So when you're discussing that, and you're a student of history where you go back and look at economic policy and you break it down, talk to us about the New World Order because this goes into your thesis of why U.S. is the only game in town. And if you're looking at this internationally, you should be very, very, very careful right now. And I love it because coming from someone who was so bullish and seeing that you know, you're bearish on the international markets. I love giving people the whole entire story. Let's hear from your perspective about the new world order because it, it's a fantastic write-up, guys, and vigilante investors. If you get a chance, you know, definitely go go to Steve's site and read it. It's definitely worth the issue. But Steve, talk about it, what it means, and what it means, uh, you know, for asset allocation. Sure. Uh, we we established after a, a post World War II order, um, and the U.S. did with British help, of kind of in, really in line with kind of. British economic theory at that time um, was to create a, a free trade regime, and the U.S. agreed to basically sponsor and underwrite free trade at that time. Uh, and basically, everybody in the world got to trade with the U.S. as long as you weren't uh, part of the Soviet Communist bloc. Um, and we didn't really care in the U.S. whether you gave us equal trade terms and access to your market. You could tariff us higher than we tariffed you, and it didn't really matter. We just wanted you to join our club. Uh, it, it kind of eliminated the need for countries to build empires or uh, extend their colonial possessions as you had in the prior regime, really during, during the colonial era, which started around 1500 and ended in at 1945, uh, countries that needed access to goods or needed markets either built an empire or they they uh, developed a vast you know colonial empire like the British, um, and this led to a lot of wars and a lot of problems, um, and so. This world order created after World War II um, eliminated the need for a lot of uh, for, for for empires and and, and colonies, and um, it made the world a much more peaceful place. And it was really the principal way in which uh, Europe and Japan rebuilt after being so devastated in World War II. Uh, their economies had access to goods, had access to markets, and they could grow their way out of their out of their problems. Um, and it was a very principal way in which the U.S. kind of built a coalition to defeat the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And after the Cold War ended, uh, the U.S. kind of doubled down and maintained the, the same free trade policies and free naval protection for everybody that was shipping goods across the ocean. Um, and even to the point where in 2001, China was admitted to the World Trade Organization even though it was a communist country, I think the hope was that they would become more capitalist um, and freer and um, uh, would, would, uh, would kind of join the club if they got this, the same equal treatment. So they joined the World Trade Organization, and they had the same benefits 
um, as everybody else. But um, what's happened, it wasn't exactly what the planners in the U.S. had hoped at that time, and that China has taken advantage of its economic gains to try to extend its own dominance across Asia and Europe and become a superpower or hege uh, hegemon in those regions. Um, and right now what you're seeing is with, with Trump taking, taking hold of, of uh, the, gov the federal government in, in 2016, um, he's basically decided to, uh, to end uh, or I should say revise many of those policies. I think there's free trade is still out there, but it's being extended in a very strategic way to the people, to the countries that are really strategically important to the U.S. Um, and and trade is being, um, free trade is being extended really on a condition and a conditional basis. So, you saw with Mexico, which is a very important ally of the U.S., you saw with Mexico uh, just last month, Trump threatened to uh, uh, tariff all the Mexican goods unless they uh, 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 would take certain measures to reduce the flow of immigrants across their country into the U.S. And it took about a week, and they had an agreement. And it's amazing because this agreement probably could have been had 10 years ago or five years ago or you know, there certainly were many times in the past where it could have been done where it was needed, uh, but uh, but it, when they had the pressure where there was a loss of trade access to this great market, the U.S., um, then they made the changes that they needed to make to get it done, and um, and 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 so it's being used as, as a strategic tool, and it's definitely being used as a, as a strategic tool with with China, but. Um, it's it's a it's 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 a pretty problematic uh, situation to you know for, for 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 Trump to try to maintain some kind of a trading relationship with China while he's really trying to at the same time reduce their ability to um, compete with the U.S. as a geopolitical force um, and uh, but but. So China's got problems. It's not just that they're they're finding that the, their access to the U.S. consumer is being threatened, and therefore their economy growth will slow substantially. Uh, but they're they're going to find that they have less access to technology, so they can't build the products that they thought they could build. Um, that's a big part of it. Is is to where Trump wants to. Uh, really reduce their ability to compete in development of 5G networks and that sort of thing. Um, and they're also, he's also, um, um, uh, he's, I, think, I think he's also doing other things such as with the uh, Persian Gulf and, and uh, he, Trump has said that he's no longer gonna protect naval shipments, uh, tankers flowing through the P Persian Gulf because the US doesn't need oil anymore. Well, that doesn't hurt Britain or France or Japan because they have long-range naval vessels that can protect their own shipments. But it's going to destroy China if they can't get their oil shipments through the Persian Gulf. They're very dependent on it. So all the way around, you, you see a foreign policy in the U.S. that's being strategic, uh, in term, and it's very strategic uh, in including tr free trade and how it allocates those free trade resources. The economies that you thought were going to grow with the with the with the overall economy in the past, it was an automatic like China. It's not there anymore. China's growth is going to be much slower, and they have other problems too. I mean, they've got huge debt. They have terrible demographics. China's going to be a slow growth country, and and uh, it will be lucky to, for if they can keep the stock market where it is for the next ten years. There are other countries that are aligned with the U.S., like Mexico, like India, that are going to do very, very well. Um, but, you know, if you've got good demographics, you have good trade relations with the U.S., and you don't have really bad debt, um, and there are some European economies with really bad debt problems, but if you don't have that really bad debt, then you probably have some good prospects. But I think that international investors have to be careful and allocate their money where 
uh, if they are alloc- allocated internationally, where where the uh, opportunities are still good going forward. And and the U.S. is the, the I wouldn't necessarily say the only game in town, but it's the best game in town. It's the best. It's the only big game in town. And if you're looking at emerging markets, you better be very careful. Like I recommend Mexico. I think that's a great place to invest. But um, uh, I like staying pretty close to home at this point in time. No, I don't, a lot of stuff uh, I think a lot of people can resonate with. And guys, this is politics aside here. We're not talking about politics. I don't care if you like Donald Trump or not. This is something that's happening now where we're trying to get through trade and free trade. We're trying to you know, make our borders much, much better, make U.S. much better, and limit, I guess, power for, for China. But even if these tariffs, even if they come to an agreement with tariffs, it's amazing how many companies are making strategic moves now just in case where – you, know, you highlight how they're moving production capacity to Vietnam, they're moving to Mexico, other countries, even though there's a shot that all this stuff can go okay, which is bad for China in the end, right? Because they're taking a lot of that uh, growth and manufacturing out of China and moving it elsewhere. This way they don't have to have problems with it. But one of the things that you highlight, which I want to get to, is you know when you talk about the foreign markets, you talk about large economies falling behind the U.S., you look at the bond market, talk about negative yields in, in Germany and a lot of other places – uh, and have those negative yields uh, also imply low expectations for you know the European economy and the stock markets, right? A lot we just talked about. And you say, despite the poor recent returns, some advisors are increasing that you have more of an allocation towards international stocks and international places, uh, and it's driven in part by a view that the markets will return will revert back to the mean. I hear this term all the time, Steve. I've heard it over the last five years when it comes to margins, when it comes to profits. And yet I think people don't understand the landscape has changed where you and I and, you know, I I mean, we we used to back in the day, even my dad used to have to go to the library to get 10 K's. Now, I mean, the productivity has increased dramatically, but yet we're looking at old models that people say, well, it's got to revert back to the mean. Does everything always have to revert back to the mean or is it, hey, these are secular changes and this is one that you're talking about because this is a really big deal when you're looking at some of the best analysts in the world thinking, hey, everything's going to go back to the way it was, but yet the world is a much different place, especially when we have the internet and new technologies and AI capabilities and cloud. I want to get your thoughts on that because you know, a lot of people do believe we're going to revert back to me. I heard that argument for the last three, four years. It hasn't happened. Stocks continue to move up. Margins continue to expand. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, I, I think that Things are changing so fast that reversion to the mean could be one of the most dangerous trading strategies you could have or investment strategies you could have. And uh, with the world order changing so dramatically um, and access to the biggest consumer market of all time, which is the U.S., it has been, it still is, and it will be for a long time, access to that market now being allocated and rationed on the basis of of really whether the country is strategically complementary with the U.S., that changes the whole game. And and so you can't just look at these countries and lump all these emerging market countries together or lump all these international markets to, or countries together and just say, oh, they're all going to rally similarly with the U.S. when there's a, uh, economic growth across the world. No, the growth is going to be less even. And – and the uh, and 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 the problems are going to be very different in the different places, um, and so the economic returns are going to be very different. Um, and uh, and and so yes, I, I think that I think that the last thing you want to do is just uh, kind of invest robotically according to uh, previous historical trends and and expect a reversion to the mean. I, it's just not going to happen. And and my best example of that is Japan. Uh, in 1989, I think it hit a, uh, the Nikkei hit a high of something like 39,000. I can't remember the exact number, but it was, it's still barely above 20,000 now. And it's been languishing between 12 and 22 or 23 for the last 20 years. Um, and, and you, it's just, it's just, if you were investing in the Japanese stock market all this time, you you basically had a negative return. Um, you you may have invested 10 or 15 years ago and made a little bit of money, but it still wouldn't be that much. That's what you have to look forward to with China. And, and so I, I, that's the one thing, like if I could get people to understand that 
you, you're, you're looking at, when you're looking at a big change of regime or you're looking at, at a very severe debt problem, you can't look at past history and expect it to repeat itself. It's, it's going to be different. And uh, maybe there will be some mean reversion over a very, very long period of time, but we don't know what we're, we're reverting to. We might be reverting to a world order of 100 years ago when the U.S. was, the, was the, by far the biggest and only game in town, and maybe that's what we're back to now. And we're certainly moving in that direction. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more that, that, that things are different now and you have to look at the situation um, in, in, a, you know, in a very specific way to, to try to figure out what's going on and where, where you can make money based on that. Now, just to add to that thesis now, let's, let's, let's change things a little bit here, but saying that you know, the only game in town, one of the biggest things for the U.S., especially over the past 10 years, was shell oil, uh, where we discovered how to uh, – tons of oil, right? Almost unlimited supply depending on what the price is, right? <laughs> it's pretty crazy how much we can drill if it goes higher. We can drill deeper and deeper and deeper, especially a place like the Permian. But now we've become one of the largest producers in the world in oil, which – 15 years ago is probably unheard of. 20 years ago, you, you would have said you're absolutely crazy. We're actually creating export, uh, import facilities for natural gas and things like that. Now they're export facilities. So you're very bullish on oil. And I read your issue. I won't get into it. I'll let you explain it. But why are you so bullish on oil? And is it just oil prices or oil companies? Because when we look at the balance sheets, these guys have been pushing their debt out further, further, and further. It's one of the most heavily debted industries. I'd be very selective with those stocks. You see prices going higher. Who's going to be the beneficiaries? But what? why are you so bullish on oil? Not just now, but it seems like you're going to be bullish for a very long time. I I like I like um, I think oil prices have some upside to them, and it's because of what's going on in the Persian Gulf, uh, and specifically with Iran. Um, and then I would a add to that that I don't like every oil company out there. I think that you have to be careful about where you very careful about where you invest in oil because the the price swings are still going to be pretty big, and they're going to be the indebted companies are going to have problems when prices go down. Um, but in the Persian Gulf, um, you have two issues with the Persian Gulf. First, um, the new sanctions on Iran are in the process of taking about 2 million barrels a day of supply off the market. Um, the previous uh, sanction regime, uh, when uh, President Obama was trying to negotiate an agreement with uh, Iran to curtail their nuclear uh, capabilities, um, that cut about a million barrels a day out of the oil supply because there were there were um, exemptions offered out to China and Japan and South Korea and I think India. And then um, that was about a million barrels a day that they were allowed to export through that period of time. But um, there are no exemptions now. And there's really almost no way to get around the sanctions because um, under the Obama administration, the U.S. got control of SWIFT and to a degree where <clears throat> if somebody violates uh, sanctions, there's a secondary sanction basically that uh, you could, you'll get cut off from SWIFT. So there isn't a bank out there that deals um, in the international economy. There isn't really a business. There isn't a country that wants to get cut off from the international payment mechanism of the world. Um, so these sanctions, as long as Trump wants to hold, on, hold, hold, uh, hold Iran's feet to the fire, they are going to keep all of Iran's exports off the market, um, which is about 2 million barrels a day. And as that 2 million barrels a day hit, and it's on top of already shrinking supply from Venezuela, and it will probably continue to shrink. And you never know what's going to happen with Libya. Libya may have problems in the future. They historically do have problems where their, their oil supplies just get cut off for a few months. You've got, you've got some some risk to the supply out there and, and really some built-in cuts to the supply, which will support the price of oil over time. Um, and Saudi Arabia doesn't really have an interest in pumping up enough, pumping up out enough oil to suppress the price of oil until it gets above $80 a barrel. 
so you, you're, in a, you're in a situation where the only really swing producer out there is the Permian Basin in the U.S. Um, and those suppliers are going to continue to produce as much as they can at these prices at $60 or 70 or whatever it is. They're going to produce as much as they can. And there are some producers out there that are very profitable because the all-in cost of oil is you know, in the mid-40s for them. And once the oil rig is drilled, their operating cost is in the 20s. Um, so they, they, they can invest pretty confidently, and as long as they keep their debt levels low, um, uh, they will be able to stay in business and weather the storms of the price swings. So, so yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm modestly bullish on oil. I think that as, as long as the Persian Gulf supplies are constrained, that's going to be a good thing. You never know whether Iran will succeed at cutting off other people shipping like the UAE um, uh, or Kuwait that ship through the Persian Gulf. If they'll be able to cut that off, then you'll see a real spike to oil prices. But even if that doesn't happen, I think you have decent upside to the oil price. Um, and if you just have a $70, 60 70 $75 oil price uh, for Brent crude, I'm talking, and you're talking about West Texas being 5 to $10 a barrel less than that, these Permian producers out there, um, like Pioneer or Diamondback, they have exceptionally high profitability, and they're growing their production, and their debt is very low, and they're 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 built they're growing their production just out of their cash flows, um, and uh, they're paying dividends, and they're buying back stock. They're doing all the right things. These companies are going to have substantially growing um, earnings. Um, they're real bargains. All right, let's change things again because there's an industry that you've been writing about, and that is the healthcare industry, something I covered extensively probably about six to nine months ago, and it was really scary. I mean, it's it, we kind of could all identify with the numbers. If you own your own business, uh, you know healthcare costs are going tremendously. If you listen to the news cycle politically, you're seeing how you know Medicare for all for free and all this crazy stuff uh, by some of the candidates. Uh, I want to dig into to what you've learned about the industry and how you feel about the industry because my take was was very scary where we're going to see costs raised tremendously, but what's very scary is there is no end in sight. There is no solution on the table. There's not even like a, a little bit of a solution on the table of, of how this is going to change where prices aren't going to go up tremendously. And there is specific companies that are going to benefit, right? So putting your, your ego aside and everything else and your personal feelings aside, but there's a lot of companies in the healthcare industry where – if the Affordable Health Care Act is permanent now, right? So we, we have, you know, everybody hates each other. Nothing's really going to get done in Washington. But if that's permanent, you're looking at 30 million, maybe 40 million people getting health care being paid by people who are working right now. But that means more medical devices, more prescriptions, more everything. That's some of the findings that that, that I went through in much more detail. But it was just I, I was very scared after my research saying there is no solution in sight. I want to see where you went with this because I haven't read it. I know you're coming out with this, I believe, later on today. Uh, Wednesday, but let me know. You know. For me, I'm curious what you found and what are going to be the beneficiaries and what people need to know the most in healthcare because it's such a difficult, complicated subject. But when it comes to investing, there's a lot of money to be made in that industry, I believe. Well, I think you've seen a lot of the healthcare stocks have, have gotten trashed this year. Um, it's the worst performing sector out there. It's, it's even worse than the oil company sector. Um, and I think a lot of it really comes from. Uh, uh, 2020 election politics. Um, Bernie Sanders is kind of leading the cheer for Medicare for all, and really all of the major candidates except for Joe Biden uh, want Medicare for everybody, uh, kind of a public health care system for everybody, specifically med uh, Medicare, and they want to eliminate private insurance. And so it's understandable that would be very disruptive. It's understandable that investors would be concerned about that, especially when they look at the public opinion polls. And all of the top four Democrat candidates uh, in polls, public opinion polls, um, show that they would they would beat Trump if the election were today easily. So it kind of looks like, oh, this is a really dangerous situation. Um, but. There's a few reasons why it's really not so dangerous. 
um, I, I can see why investors are concerned and why people would be concerned, because if you just look at it on the surface, um, there is a lot of cause for concern. But um, the first is Medicare for all is a pipe dream. It can't happen. Um, 60% Medicare, Medicare charges about 60% of the real cost. That means that everybody else that, that, that uses private health insurance for their health care, um, they're really subsidizing Medicare because, you know, if, 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 you know, not, they can't, the, op, the, the, the people that are providing health care services, they can't operate at 60% for everybody, though. So, so that subsidy, if that subsidy disappears for Medicare, Medicare costs, Medicare prices or costs have to rise by, you know, 40, 50% in order to compensate for that loss of subsidy uh, uh, that Medicare is currently getting. And Medicare, if you did have a Medicare for all, you would have a massively shrinking supply of services if you auto, all, all of a sudden cut the price by 40% across the board. Um, you know, where would you find a doctor? I mean, they'd start retiring. There would be fewer and fewer people that could afford to provide medical services if the costs, if the prices were cut that much. So it just, it just can't happen. It, it, the, this, this idea of a public healthcare system, it's, it's just not, it's not ready for America. Um, and certainly not within the context of Medicare and the Medicare system. And the other thing about Medicare is, it's it's very popular and successful, but what makes it popular is private insurance. Um, the 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 Medicare Part C uh, Medicare Advantage program, which was started in the late 90s, and um, the Part D, which is the prescription drug coverage, are both private insurance programs that at least the the drug coverage is is partially subsidized by the government, but they allow uh, senior citizens to fill the gaps in the coverage that Medicare doesn't provide. And because, because the seniors are able to pick and choose what coverage they meet, need and customize it to their perp, to, for their own purposes, they're getting exactly what they want and they're paying what they can to get what they want. And so it's, it's made Medicare very, very, uh, 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 have a very high favorability rating within, within the senior citizen community. If you took away those supplemental and private insurance programs, I guarantee you it wouldn't be popular. Um, so for many, many reasons, this whole idea of eliminating private insurance um, and going to Medicare for all, it's just not going to happen. And um, so, you know, and I also think like the early polls, you know, that you're seeing that would indicate that Trump is going to lose pretty easily. If you look at the last 10 elections, the early polls have gotten it wrong nine out of 10 times. Um, in the end, it's all about the economy. If the economy is strong, it's perceived as stronger than it typically is, people rarely make a change uh, in the regime. So I think the odds are stacked in, in, in favor of Trump's reelection, which would also limit the risk to this sector. Um, uh, and so I think that there's there's some health insurance stocks out there that are priced pretty attractively. And if you're looking at it from the same viewpoint that I am, that there's a lot of talk about change, but the change is not likely to happen, that there's some good opportunities there for investors. Yeah, and we we you know I jumped on this again around six months ago, I think, maybe a little bit longer. But and yeah, I mean, all the rhetoric coming out from all the politicians uh, that that pick that we recommended a healthcare pick is down a little bit. But I mean, at these prices, uh, I mean, to me that they're incredibly cheap, considering I don't see a change on the horizon either. Uh, we'll see who gets elected. And even if, if it's a Democrat, I don't see too much change. Uh, it's gonna be very difficult as we see both sides. It doesn't matter what side Democrat or Republican comes up with a great idea. The other side's going to automatically oppose it and trash it. That's that's the environment we're in right now. It's not going right. to change anytime soon. And, and it, the fact that it's not going to change means that there's tons of money that's going to flow into health care. And a lot of that is, is going to be dedicated to, to insurance companies. And the fact that it's just, hey, a political risk right now uh, after that or even going into the election cycle or going into 2020 uh, these things are they're cheap right now so I definitely agree now we covered a whole bunch of stuff right 
New World Order. <laughs> we covered oil prices. We covered uh, healthcare. And you did provide a couple of stocks. And that's why people love you, Steve, when having the podcast, because you always have some great ideas. Uh, I heard you mention Pioneer Diamondback as oil plays, kind of like a short China or just avoid China and buy Mexico. Um, in healthcare, is it is it the health insurers that, that we should focus on? And you don't have to really get into any names and don't give anything away that people are paying for in your newsletter. But is it the insurers that you're going for in, in healthcare? Is there any any names that you could share? Maybe not even that in that sector, but other places that you're looking. Well, I I I, I, um, I want to give my uh, subscribers a chance to to read my report before um, coming going public with uh, with any specific names. But the, 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 if you look at the health insurance sector and you look at those insurers. There are a number that are very attractively priced right now, and um, so so yeah, that's that's the area that I would zero in on for 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 your listeners. And real quick with oil, because I know you mentioned Pioneer. Pioneer is one of the biggest players within the Permian. There's also, I believe, ERG Resources has exposure. I look at Continental, which has a lot of exposure to the Bakken. But you're sticking with the Permian and Pioneer. I mean that that that's pretty much the the, the king of the jungle right there, right? When it comes to yeah, shale. I also like I also like Diamondback, and what I do, what I like about them is I like I like they they have um, all of their activities concentrated in the Delaware and the Midland basins, which are the most productive areas. Um, they have very substantial economies of scale, um, and in in those areas, the stack of layers of oil in the shale is just so much that these producers can extract from multiple layers at one time. And, and, and so it's the only place in the shale where you can get so much scale that even companies like Exxon and Chevron and Occidental want to be there. In the, in the past, those guys avoided the shale because it was, it was, there wasn't enough scale for them. But in the Permian, they can get the scale and they can get their costs down very low. So when you get cycles of oil prices going down significantly from time to time, just as they're going to go up significantly from time to time, you can weather the storm if you're at a, in the Permian with a, with a company that has a very low debt profile. They're always going to weather the storm. And so that's, that's really why I like the Permian. It's, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be growing. And um, people, people or uh, oil companies – when when costs go up, they very well may cut out some of the other basin activities, um, and um, so so yeah, I do like Pioneer a lot, but I also like Diamondback just the same. They're both great. They're both great. Awesome, awesome. I know people love that you share the ideas. They love to get new ideas, which is fantastic. And Steve, if people want to learn more about you or, or try to subscribe to your newsletter, how can they do that? Um, if they go to uh, vigilanteinvestor.com they can they can read about read about me read about my newsletter there all right perfect well steve love having you on i love having you on every quarter just to get your update really great stuff and i'm a big fan of you and your newsletter so uh, again i appreciate you taking the time coming on the podcast i know my listeners love you and hopefully you join us again soon you bet thanks a lot frank i appreciate it yeah, it's great stuff from steve i love the new strategic order stuff when you look at the global markets, it is a different landscape. We always say, well, history repeats itself. It's different. And we have historically low interest rates, and they're going to go lower, lower, lower. We have our administration is placing big restrictions on countries when it comes to trade. We don't see that often. But what I learned here, and this is going to be the educational segment, because we're listening to two different opinions here, right? We heard Meb say, hey, you got to invest in international stocks, cheapest they've been in 40 years. And Steve, come on and say, listen, I would avoid international stocks right now because those trends are going to get even worse. But what I learned from listening to both of them, which is what I want to do as an analyst, guys, I want to get both sides of the story before I invest in everything. And you might say, Frank, that's confusing. And I get it. Believe me, I've been in the newsletter industry for 25 years. Most subscribers just want you to say, hey, buy this stock here right now and tell you when to sell it, which is a good thing for you because if it goes higher, eh, I probably won't hear from you. But if it goes lower, I'm definitely going to hear from you. Frank, what happened with this stock? I'm down 20%. <laughs> but people want to be told what to do. They want to hear different opinions. That's normal. That's why you're looking at pardon the interruption it is so great, followed by you know, there's around the horn on ESPN before that, and then I think there's a, two more shows before. And they talk about the same exact topics. They just have two different guests talking about their opinion, but people watch all those shows. They just want to hear the opinion. They want to hear you know, what people think of everything, and I get it. 
And sometimes people just want to be told, hey, this is what you need to do, right? This is what we do. This is what I do. This is what people subscribe to my services for. But I'm taking you behind the scenes here. It's very important because whenever I research an idea, I want to find – I'm looking at the sell ratings if I like the stock. Why do these guys have the sell? Why don't they like it? And if I could say, well, the reasons they don't like it are not going to exist six months from now, then I think it's a buy. But these guys are saying, hey, business is bad right now, plus they – you know, they're having trouble with one of their customers, which maybe I didn't know, which was something that happened two years ago and it's still ongoing or whatever, which would provide uncertainty, then, then maybe I won't recommend it. But you want to hear both sides at all times. So what I learned by listening to both of these guys, Mev and Steve, is they're trying to trade dispute U.S. Listen, it's going to end, right? So just, if it doesn't, China's economy is going to collapse, which we saw last year and so earlier this year. Why? Because they're going to lose you know, their biggest trading partner. It makes sense. Or you know, not lose them completely, but pretty much going to force the U.S. to buy goods from other places. If you run a business and your biggest customer accounts with 30% of revenue, you lose them. See what happens to your business. That's going to happen to China. The U.S. on their side, I mean the U.S. markets now that tax reforms last year are pretty much factored in. Now you're going to see a lot of these companies – especially retailers that are warning, saying, hey, you know, our, our guidance doesn't include anything on tariffs. So if they don't figure it out with China, the U.S. side, hey, you're looking at Trump, it's going to have a tough time getting reelected. And we know that when people get reelected, it's about the economy. Right now, the economy is good. People making more money. If you have assets, you're worth more now than you were when Trump took office. I don't care if you hate him or not, but that's how people vote. They won't tell you they're going to vote like that, but that's how it's going to vote. So does Trump want to lose that momentum? And keep messing with China. No, I figure that, hey, you know what? They're going to figure this out. But what I learned from Steve, and what, which after listening to him, which is really cool, is even if there is a resolution, U.S. companies are, are moving their supply chains out of China right now. They're moving into Taiwan and other cheaper countries, which reduces their geopolitical risk. If you own a company and you're leveraged to China and you're basically sitting there on every tweet that the president has of whether things are good with China or bad with China – you know what? I want to remove that risk I, right away. I'm looking. I'm calling. Type, I'm calling all of the countries and saying, "Okay, where's the cheapest form that uh, of labor? How could I reduce my expenses? Uh, I'm going to move my whole supply chain over, or some of the supply chain over. This way, I don't have this crazy risk anymore in case China and and Trump want to be stubborn forever." And they're starting to move that business over, which means even if they do solve the trade dispute, China is losing a lot of business right now. And that's easily seen in its economic indicators across the board, which are terrible, are horrible. And you're looking at Russia and Europe and other international markets. Again, Meb was highlighting great stats, great research, how international stocks are the cheapest levels compared to U.S. stocks in over 40 years. But they were – that's been the last three, four years. Except it was, hey, they're the cheapest in 20 years, now the cheapest in 30 years, now the cheapest in 40 years. And when I look at these marks, I take a step back. You know, again, after listening to, to both guys who are great analysts, taking all their data, I, I realized that if Europe was a stock, you, know, you could buy an ETF based on Europe, but if Europe was a stock that just traded on New York Stock Exchange or whatever, I would probably not buy it. Just simply based on fundamentals and growth. Right, Because what kind of market are we in? We're still in a growth market, guys. Value sucks right now. That's the way it is. It's tough to invest in value. Nobody wants value. Value stocks are going lower and lower and lower. That's fine. There's going to be a time like in uranium and the resource sector that turned around where these things are fantastic to buy. That's great. But if you're looking at Europe and all the trends, it's like buying a value stock right now. And value is out of favor. So for me... It's kind of like we're seeing the resource market. I'd rather wait for confirmation that the trend has changed before I start investing in the sector, industry, or in this case, a specific region. Resource stocks, finally, we've seen a breakout. It's 1,400, but it's more than just a breakout. I mean, you're seeing our policy of lower interest rates is going is lighting a fire behind gold, and it's probably going to go higher along with a lot of those stocks after, what, five, six years. So you get that confirmation, fine. I'll miss the first 20% move in some of these stocks that are down 85% over the past six years. Big deal. At least I have the confirmation saying, okay, at least there's demand there. Because you could say, hey, it's a great buy three years ago, two years ago, a year ago, and you're probably down 35 40 50% on these positions. So this is the way I'm looking at it. 
Because when I'm looking at China, and what does it mean for China? China is stimulating its economy right now. Europe is also taking measures to improve growth. But until we see actual confirmation of this, where GDP is surprised to the upside or you know, Germany's consumer confidence or retail sales turn positive, and the major indices in these countries start to get some momentum behind them, that's kind of when you want to invest. And now look, you don't always have to wait for like a technical confirmation. If you're subscribed to any of my newsletters, you'll see that I recommend a company like Night Transportation when everybody hated it. It was falling. There was no uptrend there. But the reason why I recommended it, not only was down sharply from its highs, but they were just integrating the merger with Swift. So it's going to result in huge cost savings. And those cost savings fall right to the bottom line. And insiders were buying. So those are two things I like to see. So it's not always like the technical part where you want to – most of the time you want to see it break out. But you'll see you know, AVA, VR Environments Company, we bought really cheap on the way down before it started trending higher. And we're up a ton on that. Vite is another one. But you'll see me recommend stocks. And people say, Frank, wow, that trend is really weak right now. Yeah, but you know, when I see the CEO buying you know, $3 million worth of shares and, and doubling his positions at this level, it gives me a confirmation of the person who knows the company the best – is really putting a lot of money into that, that we're pretty close to the bottom. He sees catalysts coming. Sometimes, not all the time. I want to see other things. You know, but if it's not insider buying, you know, it, it could be a catalyst that I think you know, is not being recognized in the stock right now, like huge buybacks from a company like Citigroup, which wasn't factored into the stock when it was trading at 62, 63. A company that bought 10% of their shares outstanding over the past 12 months and buying another 10% of their shares out there's that standing over the next 12 to 18 months. But outside of that, then I want to wait for that confirmation, that technical breakout. So for me, and hopefully I'm not beating this to death or I'm losing anyone, but I just want you to take you behind the scenes here. Because what you see is when I recommend the stock, you know, I break it down and say, this is why you're going to buy it and this is where I see it going. Here's a buy up to price. Here's a stop loss that we want to protect our, you know, our capital. That's what you see. That's easy. <laughs> That's a nice 10, 12 page report I'm writing, get it out to you. Behind the scenes, this is the research I'm doing before things get on paper. And I want to explain that to you because I know that you guys own stocks outside of my newsletters. You own stocks from other people recommending them. But this is how the research process is. You want to get two different opinions or two opinions. You want to look at the positives and negatives yourself and decide whether you're going to invest in the name or short it. For me, when I look at all the information, I'm kind of leaning towards Steve's side here. I mean, on the international front, I'd rather invest in Mexico. That makes more sense to me where they work with the U.S. and our friends right now than China with the trade suit going on. And the country seeing tons of business moving, you know, tons of companies anyway, moving their supply chains out of China right now. You're seeing the economic indicators all point to negative. Nothing's really positive in China. When I look at Russia and Europe, I'd rather wait to see some kind of confirmation that things are turning around because like we saw in 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, through today, things could get a lot worse before they get better. So that's how I'm approaching this. It's not a zero-sum game. I think you could – I don't have a crystal ball. But, you know, both of these things, Mexico go higher, international stocks go higher. But if I have the choice between Mexico investing in Europe and investing in China – I would probably invest in Mexico right now. That's how I looked at that analysis. You may see it differently, and that's cool. And we'll revisit this six months from now, nine months from now, a year from now to see. Again, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen. But for me, more information is good as long as you're digesting it, learning more, and that's the research process. Let me hear from you guys, frankcurzyresearch.com, if that section was a complete mess, <laughs> you know, get it, or if that made a lot of sense and it's going to help you. Because the bottom line is I'm trying to help you invest outside of just reading a piece of paper and saying, wow, this guy likes it, so I'm going to buy it. Because in reality, yes, you know me because I have this podcast and you listen to me all the time, but you see a lot of people out there, maybe they don't have Google profiles, they don't have any, anything out there, you can't find anything, and you might be listening to someone who's just you know, in a beach in Miami where someone else is writing his newsletter. That's why you have to do your own research, no matter who you're getting it from. So hopefully that came across in that segment. If it didn't, my apologies, but you can let me know at frankcurzyresearch.com. So guys, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you guys in seven days. Take care. The information presented on Wall Street Unplugged is the opinion of its hosts and guests. You should not base your investment decision solely on this broadcast. Remember, it's your money and your responsibility. 
Wall Street Unplugged, produced by the Choose Yourself Podcast Network, the leader in podcasts produced to help you choose yourself.